This episode is brought to you by La Quinta, by Wyndham. Wherever your work takes you, you know it's going to be a good time because you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. They have free breakfast, fully equipped gyms, and free high-speed Wi-Fi to help you take care of any last-minute business or help keep you in the know on all things sports. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you triumph. Book your stay today at LQ.com. Anyone from the U.S. knows that sports is deeply ingrained in our culture. From watching ball games in the summer to hosting Super Bowl parties in the winter, no American can deny the hold competitive sports has on our country. Nowadays, athletics like basketball, baseball, and football are popular, but go back a hundred years and there was another category captivating millions. Contrary to how it's perceived now, Horse racing really is kind of the game in town for people who are big sports fans. So the notion that there is dedicated media, right? There's a long season. There are personalities. That's Catherine Mooney, an associate professor of history at Florida State University and the author of Isaac Murphy, The Rise and Fall of a Black Jockey. Mooney takes us back to the late 1800s following the Industrial Revolution when dozens of new industries like mining and steel manufacturing created immense wealth. For many aristocrats, owning horses was a popular hobby. However, the people training, riding, and caring for these animals came from a very different demographic. One of these men was Isaac Murphy. Born into slavery in 1861, Murphy would go on to become one of the greatest jockeys in horse racing history. He was from relatively early on, extraordinarily talented and could ride a thousand pound racehorse at about 30 or 35 miles an hour. And simultaneously, he could think not only about the fact that he was often in a large pack of other racehorses who are also going very fast, right? And if you fall, you will be seriously injured or killed. But while doing that and while keeping himself safe and his mouth safe, he is able to judge to a split second how fast he's going and to judge how fast he needs to go to win. And this skill didn't go unnoticed. Long before Tom Brady or Michael Jordan, there was Isaac Murphy. Even today, he still holds unbeaten records in the sport and is considered one of the best riders in history. His victory rate, which is a whopping 34%, has yet to be beaten by another jockey. But his most notable achievement is winning not one, not two, but three Kentucky Derbies. The ones that people will probably think are most significant now are his three Kentucky Derbies, 1884, 1890, and 1891. And that was a record, three Kentucky Derbies, until the 20th century. It was not broken until Eddie R. Caro won a fourth, and very few jockeys have matched it. However, back then, the Kentucky Derby wasn't the main event that it is today. During Murphy's lifetime, he was better known for his other big wins on the racetrack. People would have regarded his biggest triumphs as his wins in the American Derby at Chicago, which was a, at that time a much richer race, and also his triumphs in New York in 1890 in some of the major stakes races of the year with J.B. Hagen Salvatore, which garnered so much national attention that it actually, I would argue, propelled to some degree the end of his career because he was so adored and held up that it seems to have finally caused some discomfort for people who had previously sort of seen this as just the way racing worked and it was okay and it didn't mean anything about sort of the larger dynamics of race in the nation. What were these larger dynamics in question? For one, the continued segregation and ill treatment of African Americans in a post-Civil War America. At the same time Murphy's career took off, millions had their rights stripped and feared for their safety in an ever-prevalent Jim Crow South. While there's no record of Murphy being explicitly discriminated against, Mooney says that more likely than not, his celebrity status didn't fully shield him. 
even when he was in those spaces, so right? So even when he stays in hotels that conventionally are not open to Black patrons, it's not like he doesn't know that. It's not like he doesn't know that he is the only Black man who is welcome there. And the experience that, as far as I can tell, see him having is this constant experience of scrutiny and of being either the only Black man present in a group or one of the very few Black men present in a group. And you just get the overwhelming sensation that along with the physical demands of the job, that just becomes exhausting. Sadly, this same discrimination would soon bleed into the sport. Although many Black jockeys found success in the late 1800s, most were left behind at the turn of the century. In fact, Mooney says this decline begins around 1896, the same year Murphy died due to heart failure. As segregation in the U.S. grew, more white jockeys began fighting the idea of racing alongside their black peers. To make matters worse, newspapers at the time claimed that black horsemen weren't as skilled as their white counterparts. This false statement still has lasting effects today. If you look at the horsemen who have shaped the sport, grooms, exercise riders, managers, they have always been present, and they still are. But it has been a real struggle for them to get back to the public forefront and the public recognition that they once enjoyed. While African-American riders have dwindled, Latino jockeys have grown to become some of the most prominent and well-known figures in the racing community. And while they're happy to see an infusion of new talent, many in the field are hoping to regain some of that prominence that the black community once held on the racetrack. Since Mooney started studying racing a decade ago, she says there's been some progress. There's been a real increase in interest in the history and concern about how to use the history to help shape a more equitable future. And so what you're beginning to see is a lot of initiatives to promote African-American ownership in the sport and also to support young African-American professionals who want to be involved with the thoroughbred industry on, you know, in all aspects, whether that's working directly with the horses or working for the track. One of these initiatives is the Ed Brown Society, an organization named after the derby-winning horse trainer and friend of Isaac Murphy. This group not only celebrates the history of African-Americans in horse racing, but also provides opportunities for young people of color to get involved in the sport at an early age. I certainly think I see more attention paid and more organized effort to make the sport open for everyone. And as a fan, I can't tell you how happy that makes me. To find out more about Catherine Mooney and all of our featured guests, visit viewpointsradio.org. You can find Mooney's book, Isaac Murphy, The Rise and Fall of a Black Jockey, on Amazon.com or request copies to be stocked at your local bookstore. This segment was written and produced by Grace Galanti. Our executive producer is Amira Zaveri. Studio production by Jason Dickey. I'm Gary Price. Coming up on Viewpoints. Tune out the voices, the naysayers, the gatekeepers, those who tell you that you don't belong because you do and we need you. Fostering the next generation of scientists. Then... Just being angry facetiously, I was like, I'll run a marathon. He laughed at me, told me that's the most dumbest thing he heard in all the years of practicing medicine. One man's mission to prove everyone wrong. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows and find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints.
trying to grab all the groceries in one trip? Oof, not how you would have done that. You know sometimes less is more. Like when you drive less and save with the USAA annual mileage discount. USAA, get a quote today. Hey, hey.